Hi, I'm Dawn Damari, and I know it's been a couple weeks since I've released an episode. I hope you're all doing well. I'm back, and this week's topic is all about healing, what a healer is, and why you are your own best healer, learning how to self-heal. This time we're all living in, I think a lot of us can use this, I know I could. So I chatted with Jonathan Goldman, and he is an author, a healer, and he's the director of what is called the Essential Light Institute. Today, I am happy to introduce my guest, Jonathan Goldman. He is a healer, the author of the book, The Gift of Body, and the main teacher and founder of the Essential Light Institute. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Dawn. Nice to be with you. Nice to have you here. And so I'm going to just get started with asking you, what does being a healer mean to you? To be a healer? is to be a bridge between spirit and matter, right? It means affirming what we already are. We are spirit and matter, but it means to be consciously standing between those two places and bringing the one to bear on the other, bringing the, what I call light, what I experience as light, to bear on people, on situations, on organizations. Uh, so anybody can be a healer. Right. In other words, I teach people a particular method of healing that I developed called transformational energy healing. But anybody can be a healer. People come to study with me who are lawyers and and doctors and teachers. It means being consciously aware that we are multidimensional beings and that healing means harmonizing all the different levels of who we are. And so that anybody can be a healer in that sense. I love that. And anyone can be a healer. And now can anyone also be a healer to do self-healing as well? For sure. I think that's the, the base. The base is to do self-healing. The base is to learn uh, about myself from the inside out and to become what I call becoming the commander of your vehicle. Right. The vehicle mm-hmm. is uh, is this egg that I live in, that you live in, that all creatures live in, right? The multi-layered energetic configuration, one part of which is the physical body. And so harmonizing all those levels and being the co- the collaborator, the co-creator of that is to be a self-healer. So how can I help you if I'm completely uh, ignorant and ignoring myself? So that's the teaching is let's start with ourselves. I love that. And what was your path to becoming a healer and to noticing that within yourself? And how can other people, how can other people do that? You know, there's a, do you know the artist Alex Gray? You know who he is? You know what? It okay. sounds familiar. Okay. Alex Gray is a, is a, um, a, a, a incredible artist and he has, a triptych it's called the wounded healer and basically it shows a person climbing a mountain and in the middle of climbing the mountain they are shattered and then Mm -hmm. as they get put back together they are a healer and i would say when i saw that i I was like yeah that's it Mm -hmm. because i came to healing through needing healing and uh you know i like everybody i had or like many people i had a traumatic things in my childhood and in my own quest for healing the first thing i did was i actually studied acupuncture and i studied acupuncture in 1975 nobody knew even what acupuncture was you know and i i had a had the experience which i talk about in my book where i walked into the house of a friend of mine who had just come back from china one of the first trips of Westerners to China's was like 1971. And he was sticking a needle in his father's arm because at that time when he went to China was the time of the Cultural Revolution and they were turning out barefoot doctors in, in a week. So he had taken a week of acupuncture training. So I'm mm-hmm. walking into his house and he's sticking a needle in his father's arm. I had never heard of it. I didn't know what it was. And a voice inside me said, you're going to do that. I didn't even know wow. what that was. 
So it took me five years. I started practicing acupuncture at the same time seeking my own healing, which led me into various kinds of therapy for me, culminating with working with a Brazilian man. His name was Jose Rosa. Uh, doing very, very intensive three years of healing, basically and body-oriented bioenergetic healing, at the end of which he said to me, so we're going to go to Brazil, and we're going to go to the mountains of Brazil to this uh, spiritual community where they're doing this special kind of healing work, and uh, we're going to go for a month, and it'll be the equivalent of doing uh, 10 years of therapy and 10 years of meditation in a month. What do you think? Wow. <laughs> and I said, okay, sounds like a good deal, you know? So we went for a month, and one of the things, again, that nobody knew about at that time, I didn't know anything about it, was that the, one of the central practice of this community is the drinking of a tea that comes from the Amazon rainforest that nowadays is called ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in, in this spiritual path, it's called daimi. And I, but I didn't know, nobody knew anything about this at the, you know, now, you know, you live in California, there's mm -hmm. ayahuasca everywhere and people, you can, you know, and I have very mixed feelings about it. Mm -hmm. The, but that back then nobody knew anything. So I didn't know what to expect. And it was on every level from the physical to the karmic, more different more challenging, more illuminating, and more transformational than I ever even knew existed. So it completely changed. It turned me inside out, confronted me with those things that really needed to be healed in me that I had been avoiding, and at the same time, opened up in me, in my energy body, a spiritual healing channel that I didn't know exist. I, did, I didn't even know what that term meant, but I discovered that I had a, an inborn talent, a connection to uh, energetic forces, to light, and also to consciousnesses, what I came to call the guides, what I call in my book, those guys, who then would work through me as that bridge that I referred to originally as a bridge from spirit to matter. So completely changed my work, changed my life, changed my health, changed my direction. And then this was in uh, January 1988, a while ago. Wow, nice. And since then, you're definitely you're still on the path. And For sure. So many people right now, they're suffering from depression and anxiety. And in general, sure. even before this time that we're in, the numbers are increasing. But now the numbers are skyrocketing as we are one year into the pandemic and all the restrictions. So how can this sort of healing, how can healing help them? And I'm not discounting therapy, of course. Of course, of course not. No, because healing is multi-layered, you know, of course. And what works for one person doesn't work for another. And at least in my world, a combination of things based on following one's intuition, Right is the is the way to healing look i i could say uh, i'm going to say a, a couple things about this first uh the understanding start with let's start with the understanding that we are all sensitive creatures and many of us very sensitive we live in this culture we have an illusion we have a very strong illusion that we are separate entities like I'm just a me and you're just a you and I'm over here and you're over there and we don't touch each other. Fundamentally, that's a lie. That's not true. We are connected. And in a time like this, when the external paradigm has crumbled, you know, in mm -hmm. all the th ways we identify ourselves, you know, I, I, I'm this person that does this job. I'm this person mm -hmm. that goes here. I'm this person that buys this. I'm this, you know, mm -hmm. all that's crumbled. What we're mm -hmm. left with is the state of not knowing, mm -hmm. which is a difficult state for people to hang out in until we really learn to go inside ourselves and find the, the incredibly, the magical realm that is us. 
you know? Absolutely. Yes. So that's number one. Number one is, num- that's number one and number two. Number one, you are a sensitive creature and what you're feeling and experiencing is not all yours. Mm-hmm. You're swimming. We swim in a sea of energy. The air is not clear. Even I live in, a, in Oregon. The air is clean from pollution, but it's full of thought and full of mm-hmm. emotion and it's swirling around. And so when I feel anxious and I feel depressed, some of it's mine and some of it is I'm picking it up from the general field. And it's exaggerating what's in me. So that's number one. Number two, get used to hanging out in the not knowing. How do I do that? I have to go inside myself. I have to use meditation. I have to use prayer, whatever prayer means to me. And learning, my contribution is learning, for instance, where depression originates in your energy body, where part of your body shuts down to create depression, then you can can collaborate in opening it back up. So that part of the body is the second chakra, is the is the lower belly. Depression is a is a, a squeezing, a stopping of life force. Right? What do people say? I, I don't know. I don't feel like myself. I have no energy. I don't want to get out of bed. Life means nothing to me. Right? These are the typical things that 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 is the voice of depression. It's because the second chakra has gotten shut down and the life force, which is what the second chakra is for, has gotten uh, squashed. So, con- so there's exercise you can do. And of course, the, the, con- the catch 22 of depression is, of course, you don't want to exercise because you feel so terrible. Mm-hmm. But making yourself do that, especially if you live anywhere near nature, get out and walk in nature. Breathe in mm-hmm. nature, connect with nature. However you do that, go stand on your front lawn, you know, howl at the moon. <laughs> yes. You know? Yes. For real. All those things are ways. So what I teach people is how to identify where the places are. Anxiety and depression primarily are part are uh have to do with the second chakra being squeezed and also then the throat chakra which has to do with expression so you need to talk about it you need to say hey this is so difficult for me you know and of course you're going to be talking to other people with the same thing so it's not about fixing it the other thing i teach people we're not trying to fix anybody don't fix it Mm -hmm. just hold the space of compassion for it And the space of compassion is in the heart chakra. So breathe in your heart, open up the space of compassion, which is what I teach people how to do. And then find what you're called to do that gets you moving, gets you alive again. All those are little hints that I give to people about that. And it's a difficult time. It's let's all just be truthful. It's super difficult. It is. It is. And you, brought up some, so many great points. Uh, you, you know, before this, we had identities to attach ourselves. Like you said, the external paradigm is broken yeah. down. So, yeah. you know, I'm a X person who, you know, for example, would go to yoga classes or would go to mm-hmm. whatever activity you would do. See me live music, live music. You would have your friends there, whatever it would be. Yeah. You can't do all these things. And that was somewhat a lot of our identity. So it's stripping away so many layers and just leaving us kind of with ourselves, with our families or whoever it would be, which is very important, but it's just very traumatic. It's really um, traumatic. And I also like what you said about the energy. Anyway, I'll let you yeah. respond. Sorry about that. No, that, that's exactly what, what, what I think we're, we're doing. And, you know, this thing I said about uh, the difficulty of hanging out and then not knowing mm-hmm. for my view is what's responsible for a lot of the, uh, mental craziness, right? Mm-hmm. The the rampant conspiracy theories and er, because mm-hmm. people people want to know what's going on, what's going on. So even if it's that you know lizards are running the whole thing, <laughs> at least somebody's in charge. And right. At least no, that, I can, you're right. You see? right. No, that's a good point because that's what happens when there were we don't know the experts don't know no one knows what's you know kind of the end game. So it leaves a lot of, it leaves a lot, 
up to interpretation and that's, and people are isolated and they're on the internet a lot. So that's where a lot of that comes from. So that's why. Yeah. And they don't understand you know. and this thing that I'm saying that it's very important that we live in a sea of thought, you know? And mm-hmm. so, Oh, what well, doesn't matter if I, if I put out a bunch of hatred? No, it does matter. Not it even does. if it doesn't have a direct impact, you know, in other words, you know, so I'm putting on my Twitter account, which I, thank God I don't have one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but so I imagine that, well, I'm just saying stuff, you know, it's a free country. I can say whatever I want. No, every thought and every word has impact. We have this incredible divine gift of speech and communication and thought and choice, right? They're, these are unbelievable gifts that most creatures don't have, right? We have the basics. All creatures have the same basics, same basic energetic structure, same basic biological structure. But then we have these added gifts of choice, of consciousness, right? And so the use of those is sacred. I, I I regard it as sacred, and I don't regard that as having anything to do with religion, you know? My my ability, you and I having this conversation is a sacred thing because it's so rare. And so people put out all this stuff. Yeah, okay, well, whatever, you know. The, well, what mm-hmm. does that matter whether I say that? Well, no, what it does is it, it's you're putting out a thought form mm-hmm. that's circulating all over, all over, all over, all over. And so that understanding also of I have a responsibility to the whole simply by what I say and what I think. I think is very important. It's true. And I also think that, you know, this is probably off topic, but social media, especially Twitter, probably some of the others, it puts people into it. There's two camps. You're always one versus this, this versus that, Mm -hmm. whereas in real life, it's nuanced. A lot of things, there's so much nuance and a lot of gray area and a lot of room for being moderate. And and that's what I feel like we're losing is the middle path sometimes. I I 100% agree with you. That's I think where I, have, that's where I try uh, to stay, and it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> no, it is hard <sighs> right now. But, but you know, but things are nuanced. Yes, it, things are know. nuanced in real life, even online, because it, it is it's just an extension of real life. But it's this versus that. If, it, if you if you if you think this, that means you're in this box. If you think that, you're in this mm-hmm. box. So it's, yeah. Anyway, no, now I agree. I agree with you. Yes. Yeah, and this could also be looked at as a trauma, I think, and people have a lot of traumas. And so do you think it's really possible for, to heal from trauma and move on and leave it behind? Whether it's in childhood, whether it's this situation right now, or just other relationship traumas, et cetera. Uh, I can only speak from my own experience and then from the experience of, of other people I work with. Uh, here's what I know. It is absolutely possible for trauma to not be in charge. Okay. For sure, that is that is possible. In other words, right, trauma is a filter. Trauma is a frozen filter through which I experience life. And trauma puts me constantly in the, in the moment of the trauma. You know, in other words, I'm reliving mm-hmm. my trauma through every relationship, through every interaction, depend if the tra- depending on how how intense and difficult the trauma is. So that is a it's a filter. It's like having a screen in front of your face, in front of your body, that is a prism, and it twists the light so that. I constantly am am in the space of trauma. So it is possible to, over time, dissolve that screen by a step-by-step process. First of all, understanding that it's a screen, understanding that your trauma is not you. You're carrying it, right? It's what I call Mm -hmm. disidentification. I'm carrying this from my child. So in my case, I have it from when I was 11 years old. My trauma was from when I was 11 years old. And what I've learned over time is I know where it is. I know its voice. I know what it feels like. And over time, I'm dismantling it, meaning I'm shrinking it. Right? In other words, it's a, it's a frozen place. It's like, a, it's like an, uh, an iceberg in my 
energy field. And it's gone from an iceberg to being a snowball. Mm -hmm. Okay. And -hmm. it doesn't run me anymore. I have my moments. Actually, I had one this morning. (laughs) <laughs> before I, I had a, I had a, I had a, a trauma in charge moment this morning mm-hmm. and I did what I had to do. I spoke about it. I happened to have an, an amazing partner, my, my wife who uh-huh. basically listened to me and let me, you know, run around it. And then I did my meditation. I did my prayer. I did my, I called light to it. I did my breathing exercise. I did that. And now I'm with you and it's not in charge. So at least it's possible, depending on the depth of the trauma and also depending on whether the trauma uh, is a result of karma, right? In other words, there's some trauma that, that comes from this, from this life here. But there's also trauma, which is the re stimulation of a karmic uh, lesson. And you just got to work it through, but you don't have to have it run you like it did 10 years ago or like it did at the moment when you, when the trauma came, that's what I know. So that's a little, I'm equivocating a little because I, I don't want to say, Oh no, you know, can, but there are people that become totally free of it and it's just finished. Most of us, we work, we work with it to the point where, uh, as I said, it's not in charge. It's something we're working with. And then, and then it actually can become a source of learning also. Right, the working through that—that's this is the empowerment of self healing. The empowerment of self healing is, I frame what I have to heal as a lesson. I, I uh, give you an example: a, a young a woman, uh, she's not young; she's sixty-five, I think. Uh, a client of mine just was diagnosed with endometrial cancer, and la- two mm-hmm. weeks ago she had a full hysterectomy. And uh, they found that the cancer had left her, her, the endometrium a little bit. And so she's actually been diagnosed stage four. Oh, no. And she's relating to it all. And she's, it's interesting. She's not bypassing. She's relating to it all as the finish of everything she has to do in this life. She's free now. She's a teacher. She's free to say whatever she wants. And she's reframing whatever time she has left, and, she, and nobody knows, as a time of total freedom. And she went in the in the operation. She framed it as she was just offering up everything, everything from her womb, from her family line. She has a lot of difficult karma in the, the female family line. She's just offering it all up to the light. The, and the operation was good. She's healthy. She's good. And now she has decisions to make. But I'm just using it as an example of she's framing it as an opportunity to learn, to heal, and to grow rather than, oh, my God, I'm I'm doomed. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, you're very beautiful. I learned a lot from that. That is. <laughs> wow. A lot. I mean, that's wonderful to take something, you know, to take something like that that's so wow, a a diagnosis like that and being able to use that to learn and grow. No, I'm impressed Um, to tell the truth. Now, you wrote a book, The Gift of, sorry, The Gift of the Body. You wrote that book. So what is that about? Uh, I referred to it earlier. Look, human beings, we have four primary gifts. Okay. Incredible gifts. The first is consciousness that I referred to before. Right, you and I can have this conversation. Mm-hmm. We can think about it. We can learn. We can uh, yes. observe. Blah, blah blah blah. The second is the body that our consciousness temporarily in this incarnation resides in. That's number two. Yes. Number three is choice, and number four is the ability to to actualize the choice to to make a choice and do something about it. Those are incredible gifts that not all creatures have, and so rather. It, this chaos, the, the 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 term gift of the body also came out of my own history. And I think many people who are uh, involved in the spiritual quest and healing themselves, I was very ambivalent about being in a body. Up until when I, when I came to this work that I'm talking about, I would say my attitude about being in a body was, uh, when does the parole board meet and when can I get out of prison? I think that was my attitude for for 40 years, first 40 years of my life. 
Uh, and that came out of having so much pain in my body and all this, this trauma, this unresolved trauma, and not knowing anything about what it, what it could be, right? What the, the, the cool stuff that could happen. <laughs> it was all about, you know, was suffering and, 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 and not knowing about what, not owning my sensitivity, not knowing what I was going to do with all this sensitivity, you know, being a, you know, uh, I was born in 1950. So being a man in the sixties and seventies, blah, 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 and eighties, you know, you know, that's supposed to be sensitive, <laughs> sensitive, <laughs> right. not sensitive, you know, like that. So uh, all of that, and then I and I had to make a choice because it was clear to me I I wasn't suicidal in that sense. You know what I mean? It wasn't that wasn't really what I considered to be an option. So then the other the option, other than just hang out and be in pain, was okay. Let's let's deal with it. Let's go. Let's work with it. So I learned step by step. Right, this is not a panacea. This is not, as we used to say in Detroit, "Vote for me, and I'll set you free." This is step by step. I came into my body through doing body work, through doing breathing work, through crying and punching pillows, and you know, wailing and having revelations and all that kind of thing. Step by step, took me two years of work every 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 day to enter my body to start feeling grounded to actually be able to feel the ground with my feet. And then I started to discover, as I said, this is a really cool place to live. This body, it has all kinds of things. And some of it's really weird, right? The body's a weird thing to have, but it has so much, so many things and so many pockets and so many universes in it. And, particularly then when I was brought to my heart, which actually happened through the work I did in Brazil, literally to feel the vibration in the center of my chest and then extend it outward in front for two, two, three feet, literally into the end of my aura in my heart and realize, wow, this is what I was missing. This is what I wanted the whole time. It wasn't that thing outside me. It wasn't, you know what I mean? It wasn't even that relationship. It wasn't that job. It wasn't that money. It wasn't that, oh, I, this is what I was craving and I didn't even know it. Oh, then let me sit here and I'm going to explore this. And that became my life. And so the gift of the body is the opportunity to be in a body and to learn such amazing things that can only be learned in a dimension which we are in that has so many different aspects that has the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, cosmic, karmic, you know, uh, genetic, all these different levels that don't exist on all planets. All planets don't have all the same, all these levels. So to be mm-hmm. in a body and to be able to tune in to all these different levels in different ways is an amazing gift. <laughs> That's the long explanation for the, for the title of my book. I love that. And <laughs> so you also described the human energy vehicle. And that's our, is that similar to the aura? Yeah. What some people call the aura? For sure. So for, yeah, for people who don't know, I mean, I think a lot of people listening know what the aura is, but, and the human energy vehicle. So what does that do for us? So what, how would you describe well, that? So when, when you, when you die, when you leave your body, when I leave my body, those energy layers dissolve. And what's left is, the matter, you know, as, as they as they say, the lump of clay. Right. But the lump of clay, the difference between that and alive is the vib- vibration of life force, which inhabits us and makes us makes us be alive, and is what makes everything be alive. And we have a container for that that is not doesn't end at your skin. It ends. It has a number of layers. You have a physical, an etheric, emotional, mental, spiritual layers to that egg. And we walk around in this egg. We, what we've done is trained ourselves in our culture to s- just focus on the material level. And so we're not, even, we're not aware of that. But it's very simple. What I teach people to do is you just breathe, connect with your heart, f- come inside yourself, and then you can actually start feeling it. 
Like you can, I'll say to one of the things I do in the f- first, second day of class is, okay, put your hands at the edge of your aura. And people don't even know what an aura is. And everybody's totally mm-hmm. right. Everybody's totally right. They put their hands exactly on the edge of the aura. So we intuitively know all this. Everything mm-hmm. that I'm teaching is what we intuitively already know. So that vehicle, right. I call it the vehicle because it's what we walk around in, you know? Right. With, 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 and and we, have a, we have a, basically, we have a generic vehicle that has been customized. It's just like you go to buy a new Chevy, you know, and they say, well, do you want it blue or red? And you say, well, I want it blue. And they say, well, we want leather seats or you want cloth? Basically, your vehicle has been customized for your particular needs in this particular life. So the variations oh, wow. on the theme, right, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what your talents are, you know, what, 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 your, what your gender assignment is, what your, right, where you're born, all these things, they're all built in so you can have the exact experience that you're having that I can have the exact experience that I'm having. And what the, what the aura does for us, is it possible that I've heard this before, like it, there can be holes in it or cords yeah, yeah. from entities. And I don't yeah. like to talk about narcissists on the list, but I do occasionally just because I don't like to label, label people, but that certain entities or can make cords on it, or mm-hmm. there could be holes made through your own self or something. Yeah. Is that true? Trauma. Tra- trauma, okay. is a, it, trauma is a hole. Tra- okay. Trauma is a dent. I call them dents. Okay. It's a dent. And what does that do? What does a dent do? A dent like, uh, so on a car, you get a dent. What does it do? It collects dirt, right? Or it collects rust. It's the same, fundamentally, it's the same in us. I have a dent from my trauma or a dent from my uh, habits, my addictions, my my, uh, misinterpretations, my negative thoughts. All of those are dents. And what it does is allow extraneous energies, these things I talked about that are flying around. So if my dent, let's say my dent has to do with anger, right? I have repressed anger because when I was a kid, I had lots of things happen to me and I could never express my anger because it was so dangerous. So what I have is I have this like boiling dent of anger in me. So what I'll do is I'll attract angry vibes, right? Through the law of resonance, the Mm -hmm. anger that's being spewed all over. And my anger gets more and more and more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm an anger ranger, (laughs) you know? And it's not even totally our fault, even though some of it comes from us. I I get it it because I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And so, Mm -hmm. so those dents in the, in the field are really what we're doing with healing work is we're pushing out the dents and we're getting everything harmonized under the uh, command of the heart because the heart is the, is in the center, literally right. Seven chakras. The heart is the fourth. And also it is the, the principal vibration energy of the heart is unity. So putting all of our systems first, getting the, the first step is let's clear out the extraneous stuff. Let's just like, I say we back up the cosmic dump truck. And we like load all the stuff onto it. Let's clean it off first. Then let's start radiating the dents with light. Literally, we radiate them with light. Let's do that. Okay, let's bump it out a little bit. Now let's harmonize, clean out the chakras, and now harmonize under the aegis of the heart, which means the person learning to do that themselves. And then that I call that healing. And then we Love see that. we see what sim- mostly symptoms disappear. Sometimes they don't, but mostly they also do. As to the, yeah. the other thing about yeah. are there cords? Yeah, we the have cords. cords. A, a relationship is a cord. You know, when, and it can you know, be like, good or bad, right? Yeah. Well, if you okay. like a breakup, right? When people right. Have, a, have a breakup of, of, a, of an intimate relationship, and it, it's like it's so hard to let go. And I just right. I, I, I'm obsessing about the per- like that energetically there are cords that have been linked chakra to chakra right a friendship will link third the third chakra uh, okay uh, an intimate relationship second chakra those okay. cords have to be withdrawn and it right. takes time it takes time 
it, they, they, they naturally shrivel up, but it takes time. So I'm saying enter that thing of, you know, and then there's other things. I mean, if we have another conversation another day, we can talk about mediumship and entities and, and, um, and that that's a whole nother subject. That's a whole nother yes. uh, realm of consideration. Huh? Absolutely. And then I don't have too many more questions. I just wanted to ask you about, you know, we talk about light yeah. and, and we talk about light. Yeah. How would you describe the light? Yeah. And then I'll ask you a few things about uh, oh, cool. what you do, but <laughs> how would you describe, how would you describe light? Uh, uh, the light is the, coolest thing in the universe <laughs> that's, i love that that's it, it, awesome okay light first of all light is not a metaphor light is not a metaphor okay. it's okay. not a just like the heart is not a hallmark card light is not a is not a metaphor light there is a source of light in the esoteric world they call it the central sun i call it the source it is okay. it's the place from which prana gets called prana it's mm-hmm. called chi uh, right, but it's a vibration that makes everything be alive and is in everything. So it's also the unifying vibration. So when I'm experiencing light and you're experiencing light, we're experiencing the same thing. And it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, I'm a Democrat, and you're a woman, and I'm a man, and the other person's a they. It doesn't matter. It's light. It's and and so it's the unifying vibratory force that is in everything and a person can learn how to channel it how to focus it how to create in my body the a structure that is a, a vessel for receiving light and then what happens is that the light Get stronger, my portion of light, what I can take in and what I can channel through me. So the uh, so to refer even to your first question, what does a healer do? A, a healer is a vessel through which light passes through their heart. If you're, it's a, a person that works with their hands, it passes through their hands or it passes through their voice or it passes through their prayer or it passes through their eyes uh, into a place that needs it. So you can, I can, I have, I work every day. And what I teach people to do is to become a focalizer, a receptor, a focalizer and a servant of that light. I love that. That's the best I can do in, 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 in a, in a short thing, but to say it again, it's not a metaphor. It's real. It is. It's real. I was on a beach in Brazil a couple of years ago and I'm watching and I just, and I'm watching the reflection you know, through the beach to the water. And I see the, the rays of light that are just vibrating on the ocean. And the, it was one of these moments where my vision got open and I understood what I just said. It's everywhere. And I'm learning how to call a beam of it. So sometimes I'll do it. I'll, I'll sit in my meditation. I'll say, okay, my name is Jonathan Goldman. And I'm sitting here in my altar in Ashland, Oregon, and I really need some light right now. And it comes special delivery. Comes. I love that. To me. Every time. I love it. And, and, I, don't, and I don't want to live without it. And when the, the worst moments of my life now are if I ever, it doesn't happen very often, is when I feel cut off from that. Because for me, it's the difference between just being on earth and just being and living my life which is okay, but also then having this entirely other connection to that which is more than me. So for I me, the that. I don't ever want to be without it. I love that. Same here. I agree. Cool. You have the Essential Light Institute and you have some programs and stuff like this. So maybe just talk just we don't have much more time, but just a couple of minutes about what you do and what is what the Essential Light Institute is. Essential Light Institute is a you know, it says on the website, right? It's a uh, it's a library, it's a teach, it's a school, and it's a, a healing space for 
light, for light to be ground, we call it being grounded on earth, completely non-denominational. Uh, it's spiritual, for sure, that we go from the spiritual level to the, the material. We have classes. Uh, the, the thing I'm most proud of right now is we have a 10-session class that I did uh, online in September, October, November that basically gives the whole uh, basis for the teaching in these 10. So it's actually, it's one and a half hours, so it's 15 hours. And uh, it's really, I thought it was super well done. We got really good uh, feedback for it. But we also have other videos and we have writings and it's a way for people to begin training themselves in this uh, this art, the art of living through the heart, we say. And uh, in the springtime, we're starting next week, actually, uh, on March 11th, we're going to start a series of short online classes to introduce people to this. Eventually in the fall, I'm declaring we're going to have in-person classes again, <laughs> for sure. Actually, I claim gonna, it too. Uh, I claim uh, it too. We have uh, to all do that. Yes. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here because here's what I received in a meditation, October. Yes. October. So we're going to mm -hmm. start planning that. I'm going to do a healer's training. We call it the light healer's training. And we also have the living through the heart process. So all these are ways for people. And I know there's lots of people offering lots of things. The unique thing about this is creating that internal structure centered in the heart, learning the art of embodying compassion, which uh, creates the internal safety, protection, and vibration of healing. So all that. And the, where you can go for that is called Essential Light Dot org. Essential light is one word, lowercase, two L's in the middle, essentiallight.org. And all that is happening now. A gift of the body is available on I Amazon. We're just literally in today, tomorrow, printing okay. a new, a whole new printing of it. Lovely. So you can get that on Amazon. They can find you all your social media from essentiallight.org. Yeah, my, my, my daughter handles right. social, social media. I just praise her from a distance. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Well, great. I'm about to sign off. Is there anything you want to share with the listeners of this podcast before we say goodbye? You are way more than you have imagined yourself to be. It's really okay and necessary to hang out in the not knowing. And faith, which is also a, a vibration of the heart, which has nothing to do with religion necessarily, is what is guiding all of us. And faith tells us we don't know how it's going to work out, but it's going to be fine somehow. Yes. And yes. We, are, we are together. We are together on the inner planes. We are connected by the electromagnetic field of the universe. That's not a metaphor. You're not alone. You are not alone ever. That's what I want to say. Thank you so much for that. That's really needed, especially now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, Jonathan, I, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our listeners. I know it's going to really help people. It's been a total pleasure. I, I appreciate it very much, Dawn. Thank you. Susan, you remember the time we were in Orange County? We were driving around and we got lost. And we ran into this place called Avila's El Ranchito. You remember the place? The place had awesome decor and authentic margaritas. Did you know that Avila's El Ranchito has been around since 1966? They have 13 locations throughout Orange County. Visit Salvador Avila's location in Lake Forest and Foothill Ranch for great food, ambiance, and specialty margaritas. Thank you for listening to this episode of A Teaspoon of Healing. If you have any questions for me or for Jonathan, please visit my website, teaspoonofhealing.com. You can also find all the links to my social media on there and drop me a message on my contact page and let me know 
what kind of topics you want to hear about on the podcast. And make sure you subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss another episode. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Please consult a physician or other health professional before undertaking changes in lifestyle or wellness habits. The author claims no responsibility to any person or entity for any liability, loss, or damage caused or alleged to be caused directly or indirectly as a result of the use, application, or interpretation of the information presented herein.